we're resuming our series of lectures on the subject in Lacan. Our opening statement today is this idea that the split is the subject. When we're thinking about this notion of the subject, there's always a, a tendency to foreground the subject as opposed to those contingent and circumstantial events around the subject. But here we're doing a kind of reversal. We're emphasizing that, as you might want to put it, the ontology, the thing that we're really going to focus on here, is split. That becomes subject. So what we could do in a nice kind of opening gesture is rather than depict the Lacanian subject in this way, this is the famous barred S, the, the symbol, the, the way that Lacan uh, his kind of algebraic way of invoking this idea of the barred subject, rather than drawing the S and then putting the bar through it, we could, of course not, but just that exactly again, what we should in fact do is rather put the bar first and then the subject. Okay, this hopelessness of my attempting to do it that way probably tells us something precisely about the subject as error, the subject as mistake, but whatever, we'll get to that. So if we're thinking about this, we're going to emphasize split as subject rather than pre-existing subject that is somehow divided or split. We would need to refer back to a series of other Lacanian concepts. And the one crucial set of concepts that we need to think a little bit about here is that of the symbolic order, language, structures, the signifier. Hence my little subtitle, we need to think about the subject and the relationship to the symbolic. Now, of course, up until a certain point in Lacan's teaching, we're constantly getting the sense that the subject is the outcome, is the product, is somehow determined by the signifier. And we'll see this idea is going to be continued here. But we need to think a little bit about two concepts if we're going to really get to grips with what the subject is in Lacan. Now, the first of these topics, the first concept we should get a sense of is the notion of the act. The act is important because it introduces a kind of realization, a kind of event into how we've been thinking about the subject. You'll remember that earlier on I spoke about the subject as a kind of truth event, the subject as an event, uh, as a kind of occurrence that happens in language. So let's say a little bit about the act. What is the act in Lacan? And one way of doing that is to have a look at um, the Zizek Dictionary, which is edited by Rex Butler. There you have it. And um, he is going to give us an account which will bring to the forefront the role of structure in how we think the subject. He'll give us an account, following Lacan, following Zizek as well, how the subject emerges within the structure within structure, although without being fundamentally absolutely reducible to structure. So, uh, it is included in Rex Butler's entry in the Zizek Dictionary under the topic of subject. So I'll give you the quote. Um, I was going to read it directly, but I'm probably going to intervene and paraphrase a little bit just to try and, uh, just to try and make some things a little bit clearer. So what then is the act? And why is the act so important to grasp if we're trying to understand what the subject is? In the act, says Butler, we do not follow a pre-existing symbolic mandate. The act neither simply breaks with the symbolic nor merely returns us to the symbolic. It forces us to re-experience the introduction of the symbolic and thus to confront its contingency. So let's pause there for a moment. We're doing this kind of negative definitional work. In the act, we do not follow a pre-existing mandate, a pre-existing symbolic mandate. In other words, we're not simply being, we're, we're, the subject is not simply being produced completely, determined by the symbolic, following the orders of the symbolic, we might say. That's not what's happening. It's also not the case that the subject is able to fundamentally break, step outside of the symbolic, as dramatic and uh, um, interesting as that may sound, that's not what's happening in the symbolic. Neither is one simply following the mandate of the symbolic or breaking fundamentally with it. What is happening rather is that this act forces us to re-experience the introduction of the symbolic and to confront its contingency. 
So there's an emphasis here on how there might be contingencies produced within symbolic utterances, within speech. What is realized in the act is the fact that, against the idea that the subject is simply a creation of the symbolic, simply determined by the symbolic, that the symbolic in fact depends on the subject. An interesting kind of reversal. The thrust, the impetus in much of Lacan makes us think that signifiers, the symbolic in some respects, seems to come before, right? That we are in many ways as subjects the result of signifiers, the determining influence, the overdetermination. But now we get an added point of emphasis that in some ways the symbolic itself only starts to fundamentally operate when there are subjects. Or as Butler has just put it here, that the subject is that the symbolic depends on the subject. So let's continue. He continues, we're on page 241. There is therefore a kind of split introduced into the symbolic order. In the act, there is no relying on the authority of the subject or any transparent self-reflection by the subject. On the contrary, the act dispenses with the illusion that there is a subject, or at least a self-conscious and self-possessed subject that knows the effects of its actions in advance. So let's qualify. We've been trying to say that maybe somewhat unexpectedly, the symbolic needs the subject. The symbolic is in some respects dependent upon the subject. So that's an interesting thought. But then Butler immediately qualifies. This doesn't mean that we can now start thinking about some kind of autonomous authority of the subject, a kind of psychological subject that is self-conscious and self-possessed. That's not what is going on here. In the act, we return to the experience of the subject as empty, as a moment of doubt, as a moment of uncertainty. Or, he continues, the act is the subject. The act is the subject. So what is this then? We could think about the act maybe as a moment, a Freudian slip, where something is said in the symbolic which interrupts my ego, which in a way interrupts my subjectivity, which is made possible by virtue of the symbolic, but which is not simply controlled by or merely uh, uh, determined by a symbolic mandate, because maybe it enables a different type of realization, a different kind of utterance. So I like the, the complexity of how Butler is introducing the act. We are not relying on an autonomous subject that steps outside, that is kind of self-reflexive and able to step outside the symbolic. We're also not saying that the symbolic is overdetermining them, but through the symbolic as a medium, we could have certain kind of interruptions which may have ramifications for how that subject realizes itself and how the symbolic starts to be somewhat different by virtue of what speech events have occurred. Now that sounds all very abstract. Um, this is a little bit of a formulation, a series of, of concepts strung together. So could we find a kind of example of this? The best example I have found, other than a whole series of embarrassing ones, which I'm not going to share with you today, maybe some other time, is, and also because it's cool to look literary and to have literary examples, I found an example in this book, which is entitled The Childhood of Jesus uh, by J.M. Kutsia, the novelist. Uh, it's not a perfect example, but I think it starts to dramatize some of what we're looking for here. So there's a moment in the novel where there's a central character, Simone. Uh, they're in Spain. Simone is imploring a young woman, Inez, to adopt a young boy that he, Simone, has somehow been saddled with, that he's been caring for and has had to take care of. Simone asks of Inez, will you accept the child as yours? Will you consider being a mother to him? Will you take him as your son? If you will simply say yes, without forethought, without afterthought, all will become clear as day. Now, of course, you could say this is not so much an example of an act as an attempt to induce an act, to induce a kind of speech act, to induce a kind of symbolic utterance that the subject is not necessarily compelled to make, but that if the subject does end up speaking this commitment of sorts, making this declaration, then something would have changed. The logic in this example seems clear. If Inez was to announce, I take this child to be my son, she would not only have made an enunciation of personal intent, she would have also made a symbolic declaration. 
a commitment to assuming an appropriately parental relationship to this boy. Such an act, while executed in the form of a symbolic utterance, is the necessary precondition for a change in the symbolic, indeed for a wholly changed subject status. So that's maybe one way of starting to approach something of what an act in speech might be. An act which is not fully within the conscious control domain of the ego, the psychological subject, which is not simply uh, totally predetermined and structured and controlled by what you could call the dominance of the symbolic. It's rather an event that occurs within the medium, the form that speech provides, which can bring about a change, which can bring about indeed a change in the symbolic. Because if Inez is to make this utterance, she will have, in, if it's uttered in a declarative way, you are now my son, that will affect a change within the symbolic. And presumably, importantly, it will affect a change in her as well. Now, maybe we could say this is maybe not the perfect example because there's often this moment of disparity, disjunction, incommensurability in the act, whereby there's a, a kind of realization, a, a, a schism, uh, uh, a surprise. And we'll give some more examples as we, we go along um, to make that point. In fact, let's, let's give one already. <clears throat> In a series of examples, Slavoj Žižek tries to communicate to us how split is subject, how incommensurability, disjunction is subject. So he uses a kind of standard sitcom example of a man who goes to a parking lot and he sees his car being towed away and some guy going, ah, that's my car. And he's laughing, ah, look at the poor idiot, his car's going, oh, hold on, that's my car, has the realization that in fact it's his car. The point there is exactly that that split, thinking, oh, someone else's car has been towed away, what an idiot. oh, that is me. Those two things don't easily map on top of each other. And we'll remember from the previous sessions, we were saying the very conditions of speaking, whereby the enunciative pronunciation that one is uh, perhaps uh, attempting to, to make, as opposed to how that might be received, or as we might think about it as the difference between the statement, the actual words, the content of the words, and how they're heard, how they're expressed, those two things never match together completely. If we keep that together, we keep, or trying to keep that together, that very failure to do so, in a way, is the subject. So let us complement that in another way. We've been thinking about the subject and the symbolic, we've spoken a little bit about the act, Terrific concept, uh, and let's just also say that the act can somehow often be quite modest. Um, it may be uh, a statement that I make in the context of analysis whereby something is caused to shift by virtue of the subject saying something that to begin with didn't feel like it belonged to them. Or to go back to the Inez example in the J.M. Kutsia novel, if she was to say that, maybe that doesn't feel with automatically within the remit of her ego self-identifications. But to say something of that sort is to change the symbolic and to introduce a shift within her own subjectness. And in fact, maybe how we start to make that example more operative here is to show that there would potentially be a disjunction, a crucial disjunction between what she had thought, what she had felt, how she had understood herself, and this jarring statement, which can have an after effect on her. So we spoke about the act. Here's a, another point, which is kind of more rudimentary within Lacanian theory, but let's just put it in here now. And that's just to make the point that we've tried to make many times before in these lectures, that in Lacanian theory, we often talk about subject and big other. But of course, we also try to reiterate that those two things aren't properly separable, that the subject is always grappling to use symbolic terms, to use signifiers, to use words that come from the domain of language, from the domain, the treasury of the signifier, the domain of the big other. And if that's the case, then you could say that there is an otherness which is already written into the very possibility of the subject being a speaking subject. We could say then that the subject is overwritten. The subject is inhabited by the big other of language. Now, of course, this big other of language, this big other of the mass of uh, various trans-subjective notions, ideas, concepts, ideologies, is never completely consistent. There's always some lack within it. There's always some lackingness, some inconsistency within it. 
you could say, to follow the Kenyan theory, the big other is itself barred. The big other is itself barred, which means that if this is the fundamental ground with which in the subject tries to realize themselves, they will by definition also be barred, incommensurable unto themselves. And that's a nice uh, topic, a nice concept, and maybe we'll, we'll highlight that just before we um, conclude for today. One way of thinking about the subject is that the, the relationship of incommensurability unto itself. We'll finish then, not only by thinking about the subject as disparity, as incommensurability, as irreconcilability, we will finish with a nice quote which comes from a, a more recent uh, text by Slava Zizek, and I'm talking about this massive tome of his, Less Than Nothing, right towards the end of the book, or about page 876, he gives us a nice quote which will give our conclusion today. He says, the Lacanian subject names a gap in the symbolic. The Lacanian subject names a gap in the symbolic. Its status is therefore real. And that, I think, nicely encapsulates a series of themes that we've been speaking about. The subject is not extricable. You can't separate the subject from the symbolic. But it's also the case that the symbolic, at some level, is dependent upon the subject. The subject is the error in speech, the incommensurability, the disjunction, the contradiction in speech, the split in speaking that is the subject. And it's therefore that its status is real, by which we simply mean that it is irreconcilability embodied.